This Week in Startups is brought to you by Wistia. Wistia, take control of your video marketing with powerful tools and analytics built specifically for business. Go to wistia.com forward slash twist to get your free Wistia account today. And ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter, your one-stop solution for all of your hiring needs. Post a job to 100 plus job sites with one click. Rank candidates, set up interviews, and onboard new employees. Visit ZipRecruiter.com forward slash twist to sign up for your free trial. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. A very special This Week in Startups today. Stephen Kotler is with us. He's the author of Abundance with Peter Diamantes, who's been on the program. Uh, Tomorrowland, a great new book, The Rise of Superman and uh, Bold. He's a be- multiple best-selling author, New York Times, et cetera. Today on the program, we talk about how science fiction is becoming science fact, flow states, and uh, the different uh, issues that our humanity is facing. In fact, some of the most dangerous issues we're facing. And we geek out massively about Blade Runner and the technology in Blade Runner and the best lines in Blade Runner. It's a rambling conversation about the future, about technology, about the people uh, and the technologies that will shape uh, our future and the future for future generations. It's a rambling, awesome episode. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups, the show where we talk about entrepreneurs, technology, and the future. And today, you've got a real treat for you because three-time New York Times bestseller, author, and multiple times of the bestseller with Stephen Kotler is with us. And uh, you probably know some of his books. Peter Diamantes was on, uh, my Greek brother was on the program, I don't know, a year or two ago, and we had Abundance. Well, P- uh, Stephen wrote that with Peter. And now he's got his new book, Tomorrowland. You may have heard of the rise of Superman and bold, uh, but this is the new book, Tomorrowland. Has nothing to do with the movie. Just nothing. happens to be that they came out with Tomorrowland at the same time in the movie. The same week, actually. The same week. But Tomorrowland is a generic term, right? Did they, th- Disney call you and were they like, hey, dude, nobody, Tomorrowland? T- nobody told me. And I, yeah. and, and I think my book was slated before the movie. I think they stole it from me, in all honesty. Yeah, but they had Tomorrowland and Frontierland and all those things at Disneyland Don't get long Disney ago. on me. I don't know what you're talking Who about. Who knows? I, I think with books, you can do whatever you want with the title of a book. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. There's some there's some legality, like with Rise of Superman, right? Like Ah, uh, so, yeah. How does that work? So it, it works because I'm talking... So Superman, if you're trying talking about a guy in tights, right? I yeah. can't go near that. That's ah. taboo. But I'm talking about like the long history that goes through the Ubermensch and all that stuff. Gotcha. And there's a 5,000-year history of kind of this idea of the... Overman, all that stuff. Right. So that's the lineage I'm in. Right. So thus Therefore, there's no copyright. But if you did a book that was like, why, how Superman affected my life, I wonder if you could title it that. I don't know. I, yeah. Like it, we, we had this conversation back and forth with, with lawyers, and it, it seems like you can't use the symbols. Like if I stop For trying sure. like anything like that, the color scheme, like there are things like that. Yeah, that, are, that would be trademark. Right. But if you're, there's, a, there's like a whole yeah. fair use doctrine around like criticism. Mm-hmm. So books tend, I think, to be pretty well yeah, protected. protected. Yeah. Um, I really liked Abundance. That was a great book. Why did you guys choose to write that book? And what was that book about? Tell the audience. So Abundance was about uh, kind of four emerging forces that allow us to raise global standards of living significantly mm-hmm. over the past 25 years. And honestly, we wrote it because... Uh, you know, Peter and I go way back. I've known Peter for 15, 18 years at this point, maybe 20 years by now. What did you guys mean? Um, I wrote the very first major press story on the X Prize. So 20 years ago? 18 years ago? 1996, I think. Is that when he started X Prize? Uh, he had just announced it. Like he ah. had, So he had started a few years, and he raised a little bit of money, mm. and he just had that big public launch. Ah. That's um, And I came in almost right after that. Got it. Um, so that's how we met. And, and you're like, who's this crazy Greek kid? I loved him. I thought it was awesome. He's a firecracker. I, I, thought, it, I thought it was. So uh, actually, I, I tell the story. Tomorrowland sort of came out of our first yeah. meeting. So I'll, I'll tell you the story because yeah, it's yeah. funny. A um, little bit of background. I had just spent, as a journalist, right, I had been in the Black Rock Desert, uh, which is where they had Burning Man, right? Right. But I was there when they were trying to drive a car through the speed of sound. 
Got it. And everybody who was there was an aerospace engineer. And so I spent a month and a half with aerospace engineers, and everybody told me that it's harder to drive a car through the speed of sound than it is to put somebody into orbit or send a spaceship up. So this has been ground in my head over a month, and they did actually drive a car through the speed of sound. So then I met Peter, and we met at a diner here in San Francisco. I wonder why that is harder, because of the friction uh, of, of, the, friction. of yeah. the tires or something, I guess, or something. Interesting. Yeah, I think you're... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with that, because yeah. I don't actually have an intelligent answer. Well, I mean, answer. if you're going... Into space, I guess the air gets thin and thinner you have and less friction. It gets easier as you go up, and this gets harder as you get uh, as you approach the sound barrier. Um, but we, so we met at a diner in Chinatown, and uh, we're sort of sitting in the back of the diner. And Peter has his back to the most of the restaurant, and uh-huh. I'm looking at Peter. And Peter is telling about the X Prize and how some maverick innovator is going to take down NASA. Peter is getting very, very excited. Right. Everybody in the restaurant is staring at him like right. he's out of his mind because he's talking yeah. about how somebody's going to go into space. And I remember, like, I'm looking at They're that, not wrong. And I, <laughs> I was thinking, you know, everybody else in this room thinks he's crazy. I think this is going to happen because I just watched a guy drive a car through the sound barrier and knew that was harder. So I was like, this isn't crazy. And mm-hmm. I actually, so, you know, essentially in less time than it took to drink a cup of coffee, a massive paradigm shifted. I realized that the space frontier was about to be open for business. And I actually went home and made a long list of all the sci-fi ideas that I knew about, mm. and that became the next almost 20 years of my career. Like, every time one of those things started to come into public view, I went and investigated. And so I was, you know, lucky enough to as be— As a journalist, as a writer, as, as a As a journalist, yeah. as a writer, yeah. yeah. And it, that, those, so those are the, all the essays that fill Tomorrowland, basically. Right. the transformation of science fiction into science fiction. Now, what were the four things in abundance? You mentioned there were four things. I don't want to leave the audience so, hanging. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Four forces. Four we, forces. Four forces. Yeah. We were looking at the, at the power of exponential technology, so massively accelerating technology— Power of exponential technology, which is like Moore's law. Moore's law, but yeah. it, so what Ray Kurzweil, who's now the head of engineering at Google, discovered is yeah. right. Moore's law says the number of integrated circuits on a transistor doubles every eighteen months, right? Yeah. Um, and this kind of periodic doubling is is kind of the hallmark of exponential growth. And we've also discovered that once things start progressing exponentially, they keep going, right? right. And it adds up very, very quickly, right? If I take kind of 30 exponential steps from kind of where we're sitting here, I end up across the studio. Yeah. If I take 30 exponential steps, so yeah. as opposed to linear, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, exponential, 2, 4, 8, 16, I'm going to end up a billion feet away or orbiting the globe 26 yeah. times, right? Shows up in Moore's Law, as you said. But what Ray Kurzweil figured out is that once a technology becomes an information technology, once you can kind of program it in the ones and zeros of computer code, it actually hops onto an exponential growth curve. Got it. So, there are 10 to 12 of the most powerful technologies the world has ever seen. Nanotechnology, robotics, networks and sensors, AI, neuroscience, uh, digital DNA medicine. now, right, would fall into that because yeah. it's all ones Synthetic and zeros. Synthetic biology. Synthetic biology Genomics, now, printing yeah. all stuff. All, these, all yeah. these things. 3D printing is another example you write. Yeah. Um, so all these things are now progressing exponentially, right? So that's one of the forces. Uh, the second force is the newfound power of the do-it-yourself innovator, the DIY innovator, because you know, they're empowered by this exponential technology. So right. you see innovators, lone innovators, for the first time in the history of the world, have the power to change the world, which yeah. is, you know, a fairly radical idea. But we, you know... It did happen previously, but it was very rare. It was very rare. Yeah, because you had people, like, who created, I don't know, glass or mirrors or, you know, like... But it but was a sole that, entrepreneur. But even that, if, right, yeah. if you look at Stephen Johnson's work on that yeah. stuff, right, yeah. those inventions tended to be... Multi, that the idea hit the zeitgeist. So a bunch of people yeah. sort of came up with it at the same time, and they're working. That's true. Riffing on, on each other, other, yeah. Yeah. So there was a. I mean, which is by the way, that's happening too, right? Like if Bert Rattan didn't win the X Prize, somebody else was going to win the X Prize. Yeah, right? a lot of people were circling around the same ideas. For sure. Uh, for sure. So yeah. the newfound power of the DIY innovator. We also looked at the uh, kind of the techno philanthropists, sort of like new breed uh, billionaires, yeah. right? And what was interesting is, unlike say the robber barons who just wanted to put their names on buildings. These folks really, really are interested in taking on grand global challenges. The classic example here is Bill Gates taking on malaria, right, and right. vaccines. But you see this kind of across the boards. And if you started to look at the numbers as we as we did, it's more money than ever before, right, yeah. by a step functions worth of difference. Hey, when you look at those people and you think about what's driving them, because we're going to talk a lot about motivation, I have a feeling, during this conversation. And these individuals are truly unique. And it's a unique time in history where polarization of wealth can result in somebody having $50 billion, which is just unimaginable um, in some ways. Um, what drives like 
these folks, it, it, it sometimes it seems like narcissistic, sometimes it seems altruistic, sometimes it seems like both. I mean, in your so you know, I, in your study of these people and their impact on the world, what's driving them? Is it different every time? Okay, so uh, I'm he- it's different every time, and okay. blanket statements are you know blanket half- statements, blanket statements, right? But that said, here's the thing that I think. This is what I've noticed, and I've you know I've spent a lot of my career kind of looking at what it takes to be your best when it matters most, right? And I've looked at this question, ultimate human performance, in almost every field. So I've got kind of a lot of wide knowledge about, you know, what drives people to go after giant challenges. And what I think, and you could argue with me, but I every successful person I've ever met, there are exceptions, but most every successful person I've ever met is running away from something just as fast as they're running towards something. Interesting. And I think that's not openly acknowledged, Right. We all mm. we, we celebrate the running towards the I want to put us yeah. you know Elon Musk mouse on Mars right whatever, right. whatever it is right? but we don't talk about the fact that they're also being chased and everybody's yeah. being chased right I don't I think that's one of the fundamental kind of issues with success is like there's something that in the past that's driving you forward now I have seen it, the exceptions to this seem to be sort of like again blanket statement. Golden boy jocks, male or female, but like right. the, every now and again, you see people who came up through sports. Everything went perfectly well. High school quarterback, college quarterback, right. played in the pros, and then somebody gave them a car dealership. Or something. Yeah. Like, so you can see massive success that way without as many demons. Yeah, maybe like the but, daddy issues or the mommy issues may, or right. whatever, the bullying as a child or or you know something. some tragic event in the history of humanity. I mean, if you look at how many. Uh, people who left the Holocaust went on to such amazing things in the sort of... Well, you see it, you know, I, uh, I do a lot of work on... on intelligentsia, you on know. passion, right? Yeah. What is passion, quote, unquote? One of the things about passion, if you look under the hood, passion gets really mystified in popular conversations, but it's really just a number of different curiosities stacked on top of each other, so, right. right? Like passion is where three or four curiosities, right? If you want, the point here is real motivation, mm. change the world kind of motivation, it's usually not one thing. One thing right. is usually doesn't have enough energy, right? Got it. Which is why you see that with success. There's something driving them this way, and there's something driving them forward. It does seem like it's at, at different times as well. If you look at someone like Gates, um, and I, you know, we're sitting here being armchair psychologists in a way, but there is something to this generation um, that is worth studying a little bit of how we got here. You know, he seems he was known for being ultra, ultra competitive to the point of like just <laughs> running over people and perhaps being a bit much. Um, and now it just feels like he's driven by like some uh, inhuman desire to fix problems that are seem unfixable. It's almost like he's challenging himself. It doesn't seem to have to do with the competitors anymore. No, I mean, with I him, think, right? you know, like I think Peter says this a lot when he talks about kind of, you know, after you've achieved success, you want significance. Right, mm-hmm. and I, it's about legacy. On it. Right. You know what I mean? It's yeah. it's it's a, it's presence how will in their I last be? two years of their final term, right? Like, how will I be remembered? I like, which to me is a crazy, weird question. You know what I mean? Like, That's the I ultimate could, narcissistic I, I, question. Yeah, I, I yeah. could care less how I'd be remembered. You know what I mean? You're going to be dead on a planet that is going to get you know walloped by a big asteroid or engulfed when the sun goes out. And I'm <laughs> one one way or the other. And I'm more you will not inter- be remembered. I'm, not, I'm I'm less I'm very forward looking. I'm really yeah. curious what's going to happen after I die. That yeah. way, I'm less curious about what people think of me when I'm, you know. All right, when we get me. back, I want to talk about Tomorrowland the book which everybody uh, can go check out. It's available now and uh, is there audio book out yet or no? Yeah, there is. Okay, good cuz that's what I'm going to get on Audible. I love listening to audio books. Did you read it yourself? Uh bold no? I did. I didn't do Tomorrowland. How do you make that choice as an author? You're just like, ah, it's some better, somebody's so, got a silkier voice than me? Sometimes it's, sometimes it's just time. It, mm. a, a reading a book ah. is all, it's a big, heavy time commitment, and yeah. it's, it's kind of brutal. Yeah, there'd be like a 10-hour book, 20-hour book. It's, it's pretty brutal. And it would brutal. probably take you three or four times that to record. Yeah, it's usually a four or five-day hmm. process, and so it's really a time issue. That's interesting. When we get back, I want you to talk about what things in science fiction – um, came quicker than you thought and what things are taking a little bit longer than you thought they would when we get back on this week in startups. Hey, everybody. Let me take a moment to tell you about a product I love and use every day. It's video hosting from Wistia, W-I-S-T-I-A, Wistia. 
it is awesome. And who uses it? MailChimp, Moz, HubSpot, Zendesk, Herman Miller, Sam Adams, and of course, This Week in Startups. They've got 140,000 customers, um, and they are growing like a weed. Now, why do we use it? Well, if we use a free service like YouTube, we have all YouTube's ads and collaterals and garbage, and it looks terrible, and it's not customizable. So it looks bad, and everything that YouTube does is in service of increasing their metrics, not your metrics. Well, what are your metrics as a business? Well, for me, it's collecting emails. Two, it's having people on my domain, my site, making it look beautiful, not having that ugly thing that comes up at the end of like a YouTube video that shows all the different videos of other people that I don't want to send my users to. I want when the video ends for them to watch another episode of This Week in Startups. I can control all of that with Wistia. That's why I use it. And it works perfectly on Facebook and Twitter with the cards and you, know, you can play it natively on those platforms. It's gorgeous. And it'll give you a ton of support. You want to take control of your video. Video is a huge asset, and you want to do it professionally. The analytics program is amazing. You can see on a user-by-user -user basis how long they're watching and if they rewound and watch a, a section twice, all this kind of great stuff. Um, tons of support, super easy to use. And it's built, uh, a lot of their new tools are built for marketers, so collecting emails and that kind of stuff. And you don't have YouTube or Vimeo doing that kind of stuff. Those platforms have their own goals, which is selling ads and keeping people on their platforms and stealing those users from your platform. Start your two-week trial for free on Wistia, wistia.com slash twist. No credit card is required because they're so confident that you're going to love the service like I do. And you can upload as many videos as you like, wistia.com slash twist, W-I-S-T-I-A, wistia dot com slash twist. I love the product. I love the team. And it's been fantastic for us. We got control of our own videos again. And we are now collecting emails every day, dozens of emails every week, hundreds of emails every year, thousands of emails to build our direct relationship. That is not have an intermediary between it, telling us how we can talk to you, our fans. We have a direct relationship. It's brilliant. I love Wistia. All right, let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody, welcome back to This Week in Startups, the show where we talk about entrepreneurship, technology, putting a dent in the universe, and the chronicler of those dents being put in the universe, and the denters is Stephen Kotler, and he's written a number of amazing books, Abundance, very good, I've read that one, and um, I'm in the middle of Tomorrowland, and I am going to order Bold and the Rise of Superman, uh, and all of these have been bestsellers, and some of them, three of them have been on the uh, New York Times bestseller list, that's fantastic, um, but when we left... I wanted to ask you about Tomorrowland and um, subtitle here, uh, Our Journey from Science Fiction to Science Fact. It is pretty amazing that when we watch something like, I guess movies are the best way to do it because we, we have that as a common, you know, common ground. The movie people most referred to, I found in the last couple of years, was Minority Report. Mm -hmm. Like the, at least the visuals and the... The, the, um, yeah, I guess for my generation, it'd be Blade Runner, but I guess... You, yeah, you no, for me, it's Blade Runner, yeah. too, but but I'm just saying that's the one I hear a lot from, like, when people come to pitch me on a company to invest in, they're like, see, and we do this, like, in Blade Runner, you can pinch, and you can zoom, and you can flip, and it knows where you are yeah, in the for air. Sure. But what, okay, so what things in Minority Report, what things in Blade Runner um, have happened and quicker, and which ones are taking longer? Um. I mean, flying cars, which was Blade Runner, right? Yeah. They're here, we, you know, the spinners. It, I, the spinners. I, yeah. in, you know, I in tried Tomorrowland. to buy one. <laughs> Did you? How'd that go for you? <laughs> you know what? Ridley Scott's a maniac. That's one of my dream interviews, by the way, Ridley Scott. Uh, he just had all the cars destroyed. You're kidding. Everything was destroyed from Blade Runner. You're and kidding. And so there's like three spinners left. One of them's in a police museum in Florida. The other one is in somebody's like garage. And the other one's just like parts. He literally had them all destroyed. Wow, that's... Well, he's fighting with the studio. Remember, they were fighting about the voiceover and all this oh, stuff. Yeah, he was yeah, just yeah. pissed off about the whole family. He was like, I, I don't want to even deal with this anymore. I'm just rip everything apart. Unbelievable. I did yeah. not know that. And you know, the new Blade Runner sequel's coming out, and Harrison Ford said it is the best script he's ever read. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm very Which is excited. either he's really getting paid a I, I will tell you sugar that, ton uh, of money. I want it, uh, I, I, it... This is not my idea, but yeah. me and a guy named Andrew Hessel, a synthetic biologist, uh, uh, we wanted to team up and do a Blade Runner prequel. What? How did Tyrell become Tyrell? And like oh my all that God! Stuff. What a great one! Yeah, but I've, I've, that's on my list of things I want to write before before I'm done. I'm okay, so to do that. what in that story is taking a little bit of while? What's going to come from that story? Well, like we got we obviously the flying car. Why haven't flying cars gotten here? It's just unnecessary, right? Well, so it's interesting. So in Tomorrowland, I, I look at Desjardins on the world's first flying motorcycle, and it really flies. So 
One reason that's delayed is- This is a is, new thing, the flying motorcycle? It's like yeah. from 50 years ago. No, no, it's, it's here now. Got it. So first of all, flying aircraft, there's a hundred year history. Of, them, of course, right? yeah. I mean, we've got, we've had lots of them. Most of them can't flying fly. Flying cars, there's been a lot. Flying cars, yeah. flying, float, float, fly. Some of the problems are um, people want vertical Lift. launch and landing, right? What, how Dejer solved it with the flying motorcycle is he's got, um, he can land it in 15 feet. So you've got the, the landing wherever you want, but he needs a runway for this thing to take off. Got it. Um, so for lift. The lift, there's, there are but He issues. can land and slam on the brakes in 15 feet. The other thing is So this. a parking lot. He's built his for the motorcycle riding generation. He built mm -hmm. a flying car for guys who ride ninjas, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's action sport athletes. That's, you know, which is a smart market, right? The luxury flying car for me, first of all, it's a flying car. You're going to need a pilot's license. There's yeah. a whole lot of like, you know, the cost has been spiraling. There's a whole lot of stuff like that. But the, what, what Dejer did is the other thing is his blueprints are online. He's open sourced it. Like uh -huh. if you want to build one, you can go find that online. He's going to be turning them into kit cars Wow. because um, you can't get it through the FAA. They want a lot of the, so some of it is political. Some of it yeah. is just, you can't get approval for stuff. Right. Some of it is also, you know, I, I I don't envy the FAA, F, what the FAA is going to have to do over the next 10 years because we'll start to see flying aircraft and we've got drones and they're already- Quadcopters you know, everywhere. It, right. All of it's going to be a huge nightmare. I think the FAA is in for a very rough decade. Do you think those quadcopters are going to result in people flying in them? I've been asking this of a lot of quadcopter people like, you know, because if we, you see them like getting bigger and bigger and they're carrying 20 pound payloads, like, well, 20, 200 pounds, what's the difference? Well- so I don't have a good answer for that, yeah. and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make something up. But I do know that uh, kind of the payload lift mm -hmm. of drones is on an exponential curve, and it seems it to be, is. Yeah, it, so it seems. How to is be, it on an exponential? Curve? I don't. It's because the technology is on Got an it. exponential curve itself. Yeah. The everything underneath it. Um, so theoretically, I hadn't even thought about that until you yeah. said it. But theoretically, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess we could be flying around in quad, yeah. quadcopters, or I can use them for kidnapping. Right. Like I come over and grab, just grab you with you a, with a, with a and wench like, and go. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, okay. So what else? Let's go back to the movies. When you, cause I'm assuming well, you're, you, a lot of these things you saw in movies and you're sort of figuring some out. Some of, some of it. Yes. I mean, you know, uh, bionics is the obvious one. Our generation, the $6 million man, like that sure. was right. That was, you know, and that, so bionics is, if you want to talk about like in Tomorrowland, I profiled major David Roselli, the world's first bionic soldier. And, uh, it's real life bionics. I'll tell you a funny story. I was with him and he's wearing it's like exoskeleton stuff. Well, that's coming, right? Ah. But this is actual, like he was a, he was a ah. soldier. He lost his ankle and it's, he's got, got it. a real life bionic ankle. And just to give you a performance, like how these things are working, I was hanging out with him when we were in Boulder, Colorado. And it was, uh, maybe it was Denver. No, I think it was Boulder. And it was a uh, cold, rainy, wintry day. There were snow banks. There was rain coming down and we were walking uh, and talking, and we came to a busy four-lane street, right? Four lanes of traffic, it's crazy, and we're talking, we're lost in thought, and me, able-bodied dude, yeah. stops because it was busy traffic and whatever. Right. David was, like, so lost while he was talking to me um, that he just, like, kind of surveyed the traffic. He jumped over the first lane, froze, car whips by, he zips across the next one, dodges left, and literally, like, he goes Walter Payton across four lanes of yeah. traffic on a bionic ankle without even, he just did it. It wasn't, yeah. he wasn't thinking, right? But it was astounding. So, yeah. like, when we talk about that, the You wouldn't even know they had all. Exactly. the um, right. prosthetic. A prosthetic at all. And that was then. That was a couple of years ago. Today, right now, 50% of the human body is replaceable with bionics. So you want to talk about what's here now, 50% right. of the body and you, is replaceable with bionics. And, you know, a lot of what I looked at in Tomorrowland is not just science fiction turning to science fact. It's the massively disruptive impact it's going to have on culture. And bionics is a great example. You brought up exoskeletons. So this year, 2000, or next year, 2016, we're going to start seeing the first exoskeletons, right? Strap on bionics. So you've got a bum knee. We've got a strap-on bionic brace. Now, what's better? What does a bionic brace mean? It means it puts energy back into the system. So, like mm. when you walk, right? One of the things your body is doing is it's capturing gravity, right? You're falling forward, and your body is capturing that energy and using it, right? It's recycling. It puts energy back into the system. That's what prosthetics can't do. Mm. Bionics can do that. Why this is such a big deal? Two things, I think, at just like the fundamental economic level. One of the reasons, first of all, the number one complaint about getting older is I lose the use of my body, right? right. Second of all, the, one of the main reasons the retirement age is set at 65 is because that tends to happen by 65. Yeah, you can't pick anything right? up. You can't you bend can't, over. You can't do the stuff yeah. you used to do. It's really hard to work. 
So the largest generation in history is about to retire and the they're boomers. about to get strap on bionics that can rekindle their use. So I think this is going to be a workforce issue. All right. When we get back from the commercial break, I want to talk more about these crazy uh, things that are becoming reality uh, in Tomorrowland, including when we're going to be able to make like um, organs and synthetic human beings like Sebastian. In, uh, <laughs> more in, human uh, than uh, human late... is our motto. Yeah. They're my friends. I made them. This is my uh, Sebastian. Uh, when we get back on this weekend startups. Hey, everybody, your company is only as good as the people you hire, and that is obvious. We all know that. And posting jobs in one place won't find you quality candidates. No, you need a one-stop solution for your hiring needs. You need to post to 100 job sites with a single click and instantly be matched with candidates from 4 million resumes, and that is ZipRecruiter. It has been used by 400,000 businesses, and they rank the candidates, set up interviews, and they onboard your new employees, employees with no placement fees. Pricing is based on how many jobs are posted by the hiring manager, and we've used it here at lunch. And we just actually, with our first gig, we received six high-quality uh, candidates in the first day for our designer. And ranking and managing candidates was painless and easy with their interface. Um, it's a four-day trial for you at ZipRecruiter.com slash twist. So go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twist and get a four-day free trial. ZipRecruiter.com slash twist, four-day free trial. It is an amazing product, and uh, like I said, we've had a great response from using it in the first um, – First, with the first job. I mean, the first day we got six great candidates. So that was amazing. Thanks again to ZipRecruiter for sponsoring independent media like This Week in Startups. And go ahead and give it a shot. It's an amazing product that will help you with all of your recruiting needs. Thanks again at ZipRecruiter. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups, the show where we talk about technology, entrepreneurship, and the future and uh, actually getting there. And boy, have we been getting there a lot faster than anybody anticipated. Certainly, I don't think, I don't know, when you, I was born in 1970. I think we're probably around the same age. Yep. Um, I didn't think we would be here. This is pretty. This is pretty incredible. I mean, you know, know the, uh, some of them are like, you know, the, for, for me, this is still mind-blowing, you know, the Star Trek replicator, right? Like, we've got 3D printers, right? These are essentially that is pretty Star close. Trek replicators, yeah. right? You know, the, the, one of the things that kind of cracks me up um, is... There are a lot of times that sci-fi turns into sci-fact, and we don't yeah. even notice. Right. And I'll give you a simple example. You remember Logan's Run. We all remember Logan's Run. I love Logan's, Logan's Run. Run, yeah. So do you remember the TV screen where you can pick your sexual partner and it just comes yeah. by, right? We have that. It's called Tinder, yeah. right? But when I was a kid, you know, and when all the geeks got together and after we were done talking about what superpower do you want and you were talking about what sci-fi technology you want, sooner or later somebody, because we were all geeks and we were teenagers, yeah. brings up the kind of sex catalog thing mm -hmm. from Logan's Run. Yeah. We have it. It's Tinder, right? Yeah. Like so that stuff happens all the time and we don't yeah. even we don't even notice that stuff. We notice the big headline stuff, but the smaller stuff is happening all the time and it just kind of comes and goes and we don't even see it. Yeah. Let's go to the um what's happening in synthetic biology, printing up new species, Jurassic Park, Sebastian from Blade Runner we we're joking about, um, and the Nexus Six, uh, and all this kind of crazy stuff. When are we gonna start seeing do you think synthetic organisms beings, because we are printing people new skin, we're 3D printing uh, heart muscle. Kidneys. Kidneys. S ish. ish. Kidneys. Yeah, we're sort of like starting to we're rebuild starting our to bodies on the inside. We're not getting brains anytime soon. And I don't know if you saw uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, they re I don't know if it was the full eye or a fun but functional parts of the eye from stem cells. So really? We're, we're still, yeah, so we're starting to move in that direction as well. Um, I just made your eyes. You, know, you <laughs> need to talk to, uh, what's his name? Uh, yeah, you need to talk. He made your brain. He big genius. He big genius. <laughs> Yeah, we can sit here. You and need quote, to talk to Dr. Blade Terrell. Runner back and forth. <laughs> you know, Blade whatever. Runner quote. Uh, reveling Too your bad time. She won't live. The candle that burns <laughs> twice, twice as bright. bright burns half as long. Revel in your time. What a life you've lived. <laughs> I we can, I can do the whole movie. Clearly, you can too. So okay, this is gonna get this is gonna get ugly. It'll be, it'll be fun for no but, one but us. But what about like printing actual? Well, you're asking consciousness questions, right? I well, mean, I'm like, not quite to consciousness, that, but I'm kind of to like if you built a puppy, you know, or like some kind of living being. Like what, where are we at with living beings right well, now? Well, I mean, you know, in Tomorrowland, one of the things I looked at is kind of the world's first genetically engineered 
insect, right? right. It was a, it's a mosquito. It's built to defeat malaria, so it cannot pass on the malaria genes. And it's already been released, right? They, well, why, why did they build that? Wait. Well, they built it to fight malaria, right? Got it. So the idea is here's a mosquito that cannot pass on malaria. and it can, They made that. They made that. It's the first, it's literally the first organism that we dreamed up in our brains and brought into reality. It's the first fully original thing. And and we're letting it go we let, then well, they, uh, so there's, there's, procreate with other ones yeah, to so spread. There's a pilot, some pilot stuff we're doing in the U.S. down in the Keys in Florida because mm. the dengue fever has come back in Florida, among other things. Uh. Malaria is becoming a bigger issue. So. Some of that, but they've uh, they've gone farther with it in Brazil, and they've actually, you know, really. There's a lot of people are obviously very concerned about, holy crap, this is a genetically engineered organism you're going to put in the wild. What about unintended consequences? And yeah. by the way, those are real fears, right? We have no idea. Yeah. What if it? Do, I mean, who know? I mean, if it doesn't pass on malaria, but it passes on something, something much else. worse. Yeah. So there's a lot. I mean, there are obviously people have been very concerned about this. There's a lot of safeguards in place, but honestly, it's a giant living biological experiment. But you know, so was GMO food, right? Right. And, you know, we've, I mean, over a billion GMO meals have been served and nobody's ever gotten sick. Right. And so we have some success, right? I'm not so saying So why are people disasters. so scared of GMO then? Just because it's new, because it's different, because it's Monsanto? I honestly And think, what's your position on GMO stuff? So here's the thing. I can take, I can take some seeds, yeah. organic seeds. I can put them in the bottom of a nuclear reactor. Mm -hmm. I can bombard them with radiation and mutate the hell out of them. Right. I can plant it and grow the crops and that's organic. Yes. They will call that organic. Right. Right. But GMO is just, I'm doing the same thing except this time I know what I'm doing. I'm not doing it randomly. It's precision. Right. right. So honestly, most of the criticism of GMO, I mean, there are a lot of smart people who have a lot of smart things to say, but most of the criticism, people just don't know what they're talking about. Right. right. And I, here's what I've said with GMO. So, and this is really my feeling on it. And to me, it's a, it's a choice. If you want to keep having children, then you don't get to say anything about GMO stuff. Right. If you want to talk about population control and overpopulation and, and that stuff, if you want to have that conversation out loud, great. We can ban this stuff. Right. right. But there's no way to feed everybody. There's no way to feed everybody yeah. without this technology. So in it's not hmm. it's not an isolated thing, right? It's a trade-off. You want to keep having kids at this rate? Great. We got to have this technology. If you, if we want to talk about overpopulation, but nobody wants to talk about overpopulation. I've written one article in my life on the issue. I got more death threats from hmm. that one article. I mean, people go crazy. It is very interesting. People don't want their food messed with. They don't want their kids eating something that's been genetically modified. Here's the thing. If you genetically modified something to make it um, not spike your glucose as hard and keep you thin, it would be selling like hotcakes, right? Like, so this, I want, you know. Well, I, some of it is also like, who's the winner here? Right now it's I farmers, think, right. right? And um, the other thing. And the Monsanto, other, their well, partner in buying the seeds. Yeah, and the other, the other thing is, you know, Monsanto, especially in the 90s, first of all, they were behaving terribly. Yeah. Second of all, they're a public relations disaster. Horrible. Right? So they made everything so much harder. But then you have like, you know, Syngenta. Yeah, they were suing farmers and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Syngenta, yeah. which is kind of the Swiss version of Monsanto, they've, they're totally the anti-Monsanto. They've, they've opened their patents up to anybody, right? Anybody can come in. But the real thing is this, like even the Monsanto stuff, you know, do I think people should be patenting, you know, food and this, like it, it's a little- That's creepy. a little troublesome. But here's the thing. This is not a hard technology. Synthetic biology is actually a fairly straightforward, simple technology on a lot of levels. It's very cheap. Anybody can do this. So the idea that Monsanto's doing this and these poor farmers can't do that, well, that's nonsense. Pretty right? soon they'll be doing it themselves. They're every, anybody can. It's not an expensive technology, right? And synthetic biology, obviously, it's, it's accelerating exponentially, right? So it is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And, you know, one of the things I looked at is uh, in Tomorrowland is you can, at this point, buy a, you know, what used to be a million dollar medical lab for about $10,000 used on eBay and do right. all this stuff, right? And we're seeing world-class biopharmaceutical results coming out of, you know, hobbyists at this point. People's fears in a lot of ways is how this stuff is presented, isn't it? Like Monsanto is presenting it like in this way that they're going to own the food supply and they're going to control the farmers and they're going to make all this money. But if they came out and they did it like Steve Jobs and they're like, and today I want to tell you about corn 2.3, we call it mountain lion. 
Here are the new benefits <laughs> of corn. I, you know, I literally visited Monsanto. A friend of mine sold this company there, and they brought us out there for the day, and we like learned about it. And I was like, that sounds like an interesting thing to do. A bunch of CEOs went, and I was like, why don't you guys do like um, a yearly like show where you show off all the new stuff, like its new products, and explain the benefits, and then actually start catering it to the benefits of the end consumer. And they're like, well, we really care about making the farmers more productive so that prices go down. I'm like, yeah, that's not exactly how consumers are looking at this. What if you came out with one and said, this one has more fiber, Therefore, if you're trying to lose weight, if you eat this, it's going to be more satiating. And therefore, and we call this Monsanto, you know, um, get thin or Monsanto, you know, trimming corn. And so <laughs> you could have this great corn and you could make this great cornbread and you could eat cornbread again, but it's going to have massive fiber in it. It's expensive, but you're going to love it. Like if they did it that way, people were like, wow, that's an opportunity. For sure. And I mean, you know, they did just about everything wrong. And I think they, you know, set the technology back a lot yeah. um, for sure. Um, the other thing is, the, the, the other side of this is, you asked me earlier, like, what's coming, right? right what are yeah, we yeah. seeing, right? What's not, what are we not seeing? Yeah, what the are we not interesting seeing? thing is, for example, in abundance, right? We talked about a lot of technologies. We, we were very conservative, for example, about robotics because mm. we didn't see Amazon going into the drone business and we didn't no. see Google buying Boston Dynamics and six other, right? Like, so robotics, we said when we were writing abundance, hey, this is exponential, but it's on a 15 year timeline before it gets real. No, it actually, it's it's here now. Right. AI, we were conservative about and it's already, right? Right. So what, even you guys who are studying it, who are studying it, totally we, blew it. You're we, like, we were too conservative on yeah. some of this stuff. One of the things we were more aggressive on is it turns out that, um, some of the genetics stuff, mm. turns out genetics seems, uh, it's a lot harder it. than we actually thought, right? So biofuels, right? Everybody was, we're going to get algae to produce fuel, right? And yeah, all that, that was Ventner's big project. That was Ventner's like big Exxon project. Exxon or something? I don't yeah, know we was... partnered with Exxon. Yeah. Um, and that- They were had... going to build huge energy, huge fields of algae, and then it would turn into biofuels. Yeah. And hyper, you know, hyperproductive algae is really right. what it was, right? Um, and that has turned out to be far, far, far more difficult, right? And we saw, this, saw the same thing with kind of genetic engineering. It took a really long time to get up to speed. Not that this is unusual. I mean, 3D printing, right? It's everywhere now, but it's, it was at a 30-year ramp up, right? It was, it was sort of in that deceptive phase. Right. And we don't think about this, you know, one of the things, and this is, this is in bold, but we talk about, this is really common, right? New technologies get introduced. There's a ton of hype. Oh my right. God, it's going to change. And it never pays off, right? right. It always, it's Virtual always- Virtual reality, right? Yeah, it's always followed by this kind of deceptive period. Where it gets interesting is like, for example, VR, right? VR back in the 90s, I, you know, I lived here in San yeah. Francisco and, you know, are you serious? change everything. Yeah. Everywhere. And, you know, I think over the next three, three to five to six years, VR is really like- It's pretty legit now. It's pretty legit. The, yeah. the equipment's- The I, sensors. Everything's the here. The screen resolution, the- GPUs, everything is coming together to actually cement the vision that 20 years ago just didn't work. Well, the other thing that's really, to me, the most important factor is that, so let's loosely call Second Life the first virtual world, loosely. Okay. Back in 1996, we had the first Second Life millionaire, right? A guy who made all their millions in Second Life. Right. So the thing that's interesting, and nobody's really talking about this as much, is we already know you can make money in virtual world. Right. Yeah. There's an economic platform inside these worlds. I think there's an internet-sized opportunity sitting inside of VR, and I think we're going to start to see that over the next. That's three a to big five statement, years. right? What do you think is going to be the use case? You think it's going to be just people I think it's hanging be education. out? Education. Education. I think it's going to be education. So, I think how, it's, tell me about what so, education will look like in VR. So, Describe I don't know what it. it's going to look like, but let's. So, I do a lot of work on flow states, right? right. Flow states ultimate human performance states, those states of total rapt attention, total absorption, where all that's a known of, psychological state. Right. So yeah. one of the things we know about flow is, so there are five neurochemicals that show up in flow. A quick shorthand for learning and memory is the more neurochemical, I'll get back to the VR. This, yeah, yeah. this makes sense. The more neurochemicals that show up during experience, the better chance it moves from short-term holding into long-term storage. So in flow, because it's this huge neurochemical dump, we see learning massively amplified. In studies run by DARPA, we saw learning jumping 240 to 500%. So when I say massively amplified, I mean massively amplified. We become right? superhuman. So right now, we've got video games 
They're very addictive, but they're basically creating low-grade dopamine loops. It's one of the five neurochemicals that show up in VR. But VR, for a variety of reasons that we could go into if you want to, they're actually packed with flow triggers. You can actually, VR, because of what it allows, you can start getting more of these addictive neurochemicals, right? So where this gets interesting, and what's the use case? I think the use case is ready player one. I think mm. it's education, because in VR, you can get virtual reality educational learning video games that are produce all five of these neurochemicals, make them very, very addictive. So you've mm. got a very, very addictive learning-based system. It's distributed, right, because it's virtual. So it solves a lot of problems. You've got a distributed virtual learning system that can be individually customized, and it's totally addictive. So I think I think where it's mm. going to first show up, education. I think that's the big. That's fascinating. I mean, people thought that with television as well. Like, right. I mean, television was going to be like this education incredible revolution. education tool, and then that would that was the justification really for mm -hmm. you know, it was and with it, the bandwidth and and uh, I could be totally spectrum. wrong, right? I like, but you know what? It's it, it sometimes it's it happens on the third or fourth try. Like the internet was supposed to be the same thing for education, and it was, but, but it took a while. It took a while, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean you were, I, like, I was here in the 90s, right? Yeah, and, for sure. you know, I, I helped, uh, I worked on BuzzNet, so one of the first online magazines. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I was involved in some of this stuff. And, you know, I, I remember in the 90s being in San Francisco and everybody was talking about the internet. Oh my God, it's going to save the world, save the world. Yeah. It's everywhere, right? And I was like, guys, we're looking at pornography distribution, home shopping, yeah. and a dictionary or an encyclopedia. That's well, we what we did, got right yeah. now. We got there, yeah. right? But it was, a, there was a lot of save the world hype, right? Yeah. And, Eventually, 10, 15 years later, we got to some of those applications. And we did get there too with, you know, PBS and, you know, Sesame Street. And then you look at radio and now all of a sudden podcast has become this huge boom and you go down the top 100, it's all educational. It's all educational stuff. You know, NPR, PBS, uh, PBS and uh, American Public Radio, whatever. So it is interesting. I think you're right about education. Well, I also think that TV may be a – Sesame Street – standing, yeah. maybe a difficult system for education. Like it, it, no input. Right. It seems like radio podcasts, right, people love it for educational purposes. It seems something like when it comes in one channel, mm. we seem to like it for educational purposes. Yeah. People love listening to books on tape too, right? right? Audible, as we talked about a second ago. But it's something about the visual with, you know, I don't, I don't know what that is, and I, yeah. I don't know anybody who's actually looked at that, and I could be talking out of my butt here, but yeah. I think there's something there. If you think about just learning history or learning you know, physics, the ability to actually make a bridge in virtual reality or replay you know, landing on the beach in Normandy, like you're not going to forget it. You know? like it's going to be part of be your- It's going to be really interesting. Part of your experience, right? You're going to have actually experienced moments in history as the person- who we're talking about. I mean, it's kind of mind-blowing. It is kind of mind-blowing, isn't it? Um, are you net-net positive about the future of humanity? I mean, abundance sort of well, would lean you know, towards that. But, you know, pandemics and, you know, global warming, a lot of these things are kind of serious, and we could take ourselves out. A lot of people, a study came out, like we're kind of like in the sixth extinction yeah, well, phase. Yeah, so, okay, I will tell you something about this. I, you know... And Peter and I were kind of even in agreement with this. It's not that, I mean, yes, is the world improving at, at a ridiculous rate? It is. And there's a lot of statistics that back that up and everything else. But on a certain level, we think it's abundance or bust, right? Like, I don't think there's a middle ground here mm. um, on a certain level. And I, you know, some of these things, and the, you brought up the issue that I'm most passionate about here, which is biodiversity and the loss of biodiversity. Yeah. So if you talk to most scientists and say, what scares you? What are you really terrified of? That's the answer you're going to get, loss yeah. of biodiversity. And nobody pays attention to it because it's really hard to get the general public to care about animals and plants. They just mm. don't get it. So they don't understand how those animals and plants are tied to things like ecosystem services, which we can't live without and we can't reproduce. Right. And when those – let me give you – just put this in context. Ecosystem services are all the things the planet does for us for free that we can't do for ourselves. Pollination services, flood protection, disease prevention – wood production, right? Food production, all that stuff. So cleaning the water, <laughs> cleaning the water. A Amory Levins at the Rocky Mountain Institute a couple of years ago calculated with Paul Hawkins uh, the amount of all the ecosystem services we get for free every year. And it's $36 trillion. So it's half of the world's economy, right? We're getting, so we can't pay for this stuff. Right. What we learned in Biosphere 2 is we can't duplicate it ourselves too. We're horrible yeah. at it. This is way too complicated. So the only way to what save- What was Biosphere 2? That was Biosphere, like that dome in the desert, uh -huh. right? Where, where they were going to- And it failed? 
They had all kinds of unintended unintended consequences, all of it, like rising CO2 levels and ant outbreaks and things went haywire. We can't yet engineer ecosystems, right? Mm. Um, even though in Tomorrowland, I look at uh, the Everglades Restoration Project, which is the largest attempt to re-engineer an ecosystem ever undertaken. It's our first attempt at terraforming. So you ask questions of like, here's a crazy idea, terraforming, right? Sure. And we're already doing that here on Earth, right? We're not, yes, we're not yet terraforming Mars, but we're trying that stuff here and on Earth. And terraforming in this case means not like uh, the search for Spock where they make the whole planet into, from barren into a real planet. Well, or that's where, Prometheus they, that's or whatever. where they're going. Yeah, right? but what do they do in the Everglades? So that's fascinating. The Everglades uh, as an ecosystem is dying, right? It is. And yeah, it's dying and it's been dying for a very long time. Um, for a, It's fractured, right? There's massive population problems and blah, blah, blah. Um, there's a lot of different issues. So the largest public works project ever undertaken, actually, is the Everglades Restoration Project. And mm-hmm. they are trying to re-engineer the entire ecosystem. So they're doing everything from kind of one of the coolest low-tech, high-tech, kind of phosphorus is a real problem in the Everglades because mm-hmm. of sugar cane, right? So the phosphorus levels are through the roof. So they want to bring it totally back, like, below zero, right? So it can't impact the ecosystem. And they've created this huge kind of monster wetland system to filter out the phosphorus, um, one hmm. of the most complicated kind of eco-engineering filtration processes ever built. They're so cleaning the water. Cleaning the water. They're doing things like they're trying to recapture all the water that shows up during the wet season, suck it into underground wells, and then pump it back into the system during the dry season ah. so they could restore sheet flow, which means the top of the Everglades, the, the water itself hmm. moves as one contiguous sheet. Ah. And that's the fundamental kind of metric for the health of the ecosystem. So that's sort of one of the things they're trying to do. That is amazing. There's, it's, it's an astounding, astoundingly interesting project, but the meta level is, is more interesting because first of all, this is our first attempt at doing this. And if, you know, if this doesn't go well, we may be a lot more hesitant, but it's yeah. also like the first time, you know, at some point we're going to start colonizing Mars and we're going to want to, you know, get it to have a atmosphere. And do, so we're going to start, you know, this is this is paving the way for our way into space, yeah. right? Yeah, if we can mm. tweak the ecosystem we screwed up, perhaps, perhaps at some point we'll be able to create an ecosystem that's or duplicate of, that, an right, ecosystem. That's some of the thing. I, you know, I think it's way far out and way premature and, and all that stuff. And, you know, some of the mega engineering projects to fight global warming make me really, really nervous. I look at that stuff and I'm like, what are you doing? This is a complex system. And, you know, what do we know about complex systems? Small changes produce yeah. huge well, outcomes. Look what we've been doing with just by putting, you know, CO2, carb- into, the CO2 into, into the thing. We've been slowly creating this problem. What are some of the crazy ideas around solving for global warming? Well, I mean, you know, that's... None of them have mirrors, the mirrors, you know, algae, yeah. um, recapture systems. Um, nothing, nothing's really, you know, nothing's not, there was, there was recently a study that looked at every kind of all the big fixes we've had that it yeah. found that none of the things that we've proposed, you know, and some people think it's not, it's, it can't be fixed at this point. We passed the tipping point. Yeah. People have said that. And I, I don't know if, I don't know if they're, they're, they're right or wrong. I, even if they're right. It doesn't mean that our only choice is not to try. No, and I think, I mean, I, you know, I do think we should try, but I, I, I'm more interested in kind of lower tech, simpler solutions than like electric cars crazy and solar. Stuff. Right, yeah, like electric cars and solar. And that, it, isn't that amazing about solar and electric cars? They, they, they stutter stepped, they took a long time, but now they're here. You think and that's going to sol- accelerate? Well, solar's been on an exponential growth curve for a while, right? Yeah. So every year we're getting. Uh, it's having in price and up. I think productivity is, is increasing by 30% per year. Uh-huh. So, you know, when abundance came out, which I guess was 2011, by then, according to the exponential growth curves, it, we were 18 years away from parity. We're, we're starting to get there. And so uh, solar is, you know, and it's only one of the new technologies, but it's, it's really, really, really moving and it's really exciting. What, what things worry you? Most, if you think of biodiversity, it, loss of biodiversity, that, that's yeah. number one, number one, number one, because everybody, Cause what happens if we lose like these species? Well, so let me give you one yeah. example. We didn't get to this earlier. Yeah. So a couple of years ago here in California, we had colony collapse disorder, right? The bees were dying, right? Honeybees were dying. Yeah. That was right? like in the news a ton and then it went away. So just, this is, this is a metric of colony collapse disorder killed pollination services, right? Which is one ecosystem service out of, out of a blizzard of them. So in California, over one summer, that loss of that pollination service on one crop, the almond crop. So you're talking about one ecosystem service, one state, one crop over a three-month period. Yeah. 
cost nine billion dollars. That's what the damage cost. Because there was so no pollinization to there make. There's no almonds. pollinization, so the, the, the almond farmers took a nine billion dollar hit. Imagine start magnifying that out over multiple crops, multiple mm. year, right? It starts to add up to catastrophic really, really quickly. The other thing is. I wonder we, what happened with that whole bee story. It was like it was supposed to be this huge thing, and then well, it's, it's still of, the issue's still going on. They've yeah. they've you know they've identified the fungus that mm -hmm. uh, was at the root of that, and there I mean, there were a number of different problems, but one of it was it was a fungus that we had not seen before. Huh. Um, and what's going on now? I don't actually know. I yeah. you know I can, I could make something up for you, but I yeah, don't. Yeah, actually no, no, have it's an just, everything there. is so complex. It's so hard to keep track of um, exactly where this is all headed. Truly dynamic systems. What do you think about China when you look at this whole their whole role in this? Because you know, there's been a very the United States has been the driving force on the planet for you know whatever century, and clearly we're not anymore, or we're not solely anymore. Well, I mean, look at the Beijing Genomics Institute, which is like we were talking about synthetic biology, right? Yeah. They, um, they, I, they, I think they sequence more DNA in a year than we have done in kind of the whole history of genetic. Really? Genomic sequencing. Oh, yeah. So um, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. So, uh, so it's just funded by the government. We're just going to. They're bringing go in a lot of young workers all the time. Yeah, the United exactly. States and Europe. Um, what, I mean, you know, one of the things, and we talk about this in bold, I mean, people want to talk about China as kind of an economic threat, right? That's the, yeah. that's the, that's the big fear. That's the big conversation. And the truth of the matter is um, things are so distributed at this point that, you know, 3D printing, for example, democratizes manufacturing. So right now, you know, manufacturing has been going to China, right? Because right. it's cheaper. And, it, you know, once China kind of rises up, it'll go someplace in Africa because, right, blah, blah, blah. It'll go wherever it's cheapest. But with 3D printing, mm. well, it democratizes manufacturing. So it's cheapest wherever you got a 3D printer. It doesn't or matter. Shipping so it on a container. A lot, no of, a lot of people think we're going to start seeing jobs that were lost start to come back. Got it. And, you know, Peter, Peter is... Has, has said for a while that, you know, over the next 10 years, it's not some foreign country that, that is the competition. It's, you know, the maverick inventor in the garage here, yeah. here in the States. That's the real competition. What do you think about jobs? We've been talking about the loss of jobs. We have uh, self-driving cars on the road now. The pilots are, like, happening. We have drones that will be delivering stuff for us. So maybe taxi drivers and well, so people delivering uh, for UPS are the, at risk. The, 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 scary, the scary report, the one that, uh, and I was actually just at a job summit, a future job summit to yeah. talk about this, uh, that they had at Singularity University. And uh, the Ox, uh, Oxford put out a study that said 45% of US jobs are vulnerable to disruption by robotics and AI over the next 20 years. Um, and that's a big number. That's a big number. Considering so, we already have like 25% unemployment, if you look at the real numbers of people who've given up, here's underemployed. The, here, so, I mean, the interesting question, like, as I said, I, what we have learned historically, and first of all, I am loath to make future predictions. I, even in all of the books about future technology, I am very careful with what future predictions I make. Cause I think, you know, the easiest way to get something wrong is to open your mouth and make a prediction. Yeah. Right. Like, Just make a 30-year prediction. You're good. Nobody yeah, will remember. Nobody will remember. But, if you make um, a 10-year prediction, they're going to come back to you. With here's what, I, what we've seen historically. So as I said earlier, right, 10, 12 different technologies are now accelerating exponentially. Every exponential technology we've seen has created a massive, massive shift in opportunity. The computers, the internet, apps. You know, some, yeah. right. So, I, so new I jobs said, have I been created. I yeah. think there's an internet-sized opportunity inside of virtual reality. I, yeah. right, you know, clearly there's there's one inside of 3D printing. The question really is, and we've seen this before, right? We used to all be farmers, right? Go back to the end of the 17th century, and I think it was, you know, 83% of this country was farmers, and now it's less than 1%, right? Um, we've done this before, and historically, there have always been new jobs, right? Here, too... There will always be new jobs. The question is, are they going to show up fast enough, or are we mm. going to lose half a generation? Yeah, right. That's really the that's really the, the question. Part. Yeah, yeah. When we went from manufacturing, that all left. That was to pretty service hard on industry. People. Yeah, right. Service industry, and now I grew up in Cleveland. I you know I watched steel workers throwing themselves off bridges in yeah. my childhood, right? Because their industry no was idea going of away. No they're going to make eighteen dollars an hour. Again. Exactly. Terrified, and you know that was yeah. rough to see. I you know I, I years years and years ago, I attended bar in a steel mill bar, right? Huh. And you know. It was not happy days. You know, yeah. it, was a it was a rough time. It's completely brutal, yeah. 
it's very interesting. The cost of goods and what you can buy for the dollar is so amazing today. People could live sustainably in all this extra land we have here in the United States. Food is actually very cheap, right? It's almost too cheap in a way. Food prices have dropped, uh, I think it's 13-fold since the 1870s. Yeah, so you have all this abundance there, but people have to live in cities to get the work. You think this Hyperloop or any of this like, transportation stuff is going to come to fruition? Or what's your thoughts on the Hyperloop? I think some combination of the Hyperloop, the flying motorcycle we talked about. What we, so here, where that stuff gets really interesting to me is think about relationships, right? Right now, if you're hunting for a partner, you're looking in your city, right? You're looking next sure. to you. Or you're hunting for a job, you're looking in your city. Hyperloop suddenly... You know, you're looking between, if you live in LA, you're looking between anywhere from here to Las Vegas, right? If you can Has get to Vegas in 20 commute, minutes, yeah. you can. So I, so I think the entire way we think about relationships, the entire way we think about employment, real estate. The entire, well, and the really interesting thing, we know this, right? Cities drive innovation. It's because as density goes up, its ideas bumping into one another, yeah, right? Collisions. And collisions. And we've seen this work. This is Jeffrey White's work out of, out of uh, um, Santa Fe Institute. There's, there's good data on this stuff. Where this gets really crazy is, well, suddenly, you know, we've got Vegas to L.A. are one community. So ideas that are that far apart are now bumping into each other in real time. That's where the stuff starts to get really interesting. And that's where I it's think— It's going to get pretty dangerous for me. When Vegas, with Vegas, right. when Vegas is 20 minutes away, <laughs> and I'm like calling producer Jack, and I'm like, I'm on the way to the show. I just have to finish this t- poker tournament. I'll be right there. <laughs> right there. I'm going to hop on the Hyperloop and get back to San Francisco Hit me again. Show. Hit me again. No, no, I'll be there. <laughs> I'll be there for sure. Um, yes. <laughs> producer Jack's like, sounds good to me. Um, so I, you but know, real I, estate would be pretty crazy. This is, I invested in the Shervin's Hyperloop company, just a little bit of money. Um, but if that could become a reality, um, you could then, I think the business model is to just hyperloop to a place that would be an amazing place to live. That's like one of these steel mill towns that has, you know, gone away or Detroit or whatever. And people live in Detroit, but they commute to Manhattan or whatever the nearest city is or Boston or whatever. Uh, yeah, I was, I was actually, uh, I guess it was yesterday. I was in Maine for startup week, right? They're amazing. Big, Maine, Portland. Gorgeous. Port- amazing, right? And there are already people, you know, who live in New York City or live in Boston. Well, obviously Boston, but even like New Yorkers are coming up to Maine because they can get there. Suddenly, you know, an hour plane flight becomes a 20-minute train ride. You don't have to go through TSA. You know, it's not even 20 minutes. It'll be a five-minute train ride. It's going to solve some um, crazy real estate and housing problems if you could literally live on like an acre and be middle class again. This whole idea that you're suffering and the, psycholo- the psychological damage of commuting is just really proven. Like once you get past 40 minutes, your like chances of divorce or spousal abuse or alcoholism or depression go through the roof. I didn't know that, but uh, yeah, that does not surprise me. 40 minutes is the number. It and does like, not When it goes me. to like an hour and a half, it goes through the roof. Oh, I'll bet. Like, you're just, like if, you, if you commute an hour and 15 or an hour and 30 minutes, like you're getting divorced and like, you're, you're going to be an alcoholic and you're going to have depression. It's like you're almost locked. <laughs> it's not that bad, but it's pretty horrific. Um, so... Uh, and then you have another book you're working on. What? Do, how often do you write these uh, books? Like it takes you a year, two? What's the pace? Uh, you know, it the pace has changed. The collaborative ones are faster, obviously, because mm-hmm. um, there's feedback and uh, feedback. Amplifies you like writing with a partner? I like both. Uh, um, I do. I'm the the next book. Uh, I sort of trade it off. Like it's one one solo and then one you know I I wrote my first. Well, uh, my first three published books, but there are two other books that are sitting in drawers that I that, oh, really? that, that are that are no early. I started out as a novelist, so I have ah. one novel out there, and I've got two novels sitting in drawers, and then I switched to nonfiction. Um, and so the first five books I wrote are solo, and it's great. But you spend, you know, it's fourteen hour a day job, honestly, twelve hours a day. I write; it's a long day alone all the time. And at a certain point, I was like, wow, I. You know, I want to do something collaborative. I first of all, I think yeah. the you know the ideas they go much farther and much faster, and you get access to other people's ideas, and it builds on yours. And you know, it's much more collab- collaborative, and it's fun. Yeah. So um, I like the collaborative projects. I like the solo projects. Um, mm. I you know in in my experience, it's a year to fourteen months. A lot of it is on the research side, though. The Got question it. is like, if you come in totally 
tanked up, right, with knowing and don't have to do any research. Yeah, you can do it in seven, eight months, right? Yeah. Bold was that was was that for Peter and me because we had been working on the research since abundance ended. Right. So then it just so flows. When we, we, right. When flow, we sat down, boom. sat down to do it, well, we had all the you data. You get a flow. Uh, you get a flow experience when you write, right? Of course. That's yeah. for me. My best flow experience is when I'm writing or me I'm too. doing an interview. Those are the two two of my peak ones. Playing poker too. Well, there's a lot. I mean, there are a lot of reasons for that. We could we could go sideways yeah, and into 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 flow states and flow. Why triggers. is that? Why do I get in flow when I'm in a hand of poker or, so, or um, writing or doing an interview? All right. So, uh, what we now know is that there are 18. There may be more, but we we've discovered 18 flow triggers, so, hmm. so-called flow triggers. These are preconditions that lead to more flow. Right. Interesting. Hold so, on a second. I maybe I can guess some of these. Is it like obvious? Like some of them are really obvious. So, but so, let, well, okay. Let me back it up. Let me tell you one more thing, and then you okay. can guess. So here's the thing you need to know: flow follows focus. It can only take ah. place when all your attention is driven into the present moment. Mm-hmm. Right. So all 18 of these triggers are quite simply the things evolution shaped our brain to pay the most attention to. Got it. Right. So that's what you're looking at here, mm. and. One of the triggers, for example, is creativity, which is a fancy. What I'm really saying is pattern recognition. When you link right. ideas together, right? Ah. When you link ideas together, every, and you've had this experience if you're filling out a crossword puzzle. When you link ideas together, mm-hmm. you get a little rush of dopamine, right? So right. you fill out a correct answer in a crossword puzzle, sure. right? So one, dopamine does a number of things. One of the things it does is it focuses attention more. So obviously that drives, right? That drives it. The other thing it does is it, Technically, it tunes signal to noise ratios, which is a fancy way of saying it amplifies pattern recognition. Got it. So, when you this so you is can why, make more connections, right, which then puts you, put you deeper into flow. Right. So it's a it's a positive feedback loop, and we'll drive it in. So creativity with writing, giant flow trigger, phenomenal right. flow trigger. Right. So right. when you get a perfect sentence, it can lead to this dopamine rush, which then leads to increased focus, alertness that increases the next sentence's chances of being a flow thing. And that's when you have that, like, brain dump. And so poker, right? Yeah. One of the things we know about flow, and this is uh, research that, you know, high consequences. Flow follows focus. Consequences catch our attention, right? So, right. you know, that's why action and adventure sports are so phenomenal for flow triggers because – Death. Death, exactly. But here's the funny that's thing. That's why high-stakes poker is – well, when I play high-stakes poker versus playing regular your poker – Your brain cannot tell the difference between physical danger – and financial danger. They're yeah. processed in the same structure, right? We yeah. treat money the same way we treat We've been trained I'm pointing to, yeah. a gun at your head. So, you know, when you're at the poker table, it your brain is processing it like there are mortal stakes involved. Yeah. Right? So it's a great Which can be a liability system. in poker if you if you really uh, see it as too much of a liability. So there is a technique I've used, which is they're just a stack of chips, divorce yourself from the money. This way you can be truly fearless and it's hard to read you. But it is true that it does make you, it does amp up your focus level to a level that's crazy. But the best poker players I've met, they can just make a million dollar bet or a $250 million well, thousand dollar bet it. without even like their heart rate increasing. And I'm like looking at their neck, trying to see their carotid artery and figure out, is that like, is it beating heart heavier? <laughs> I'm like literally staring at their neck, trying to get a read on the, on the to see the beats per minute go up. Right. Because I can kind of tell when people's beats per minute are going up if they if they if you can see their neck if they're skinny enough. Oh, that's interesting. I never thought about that. I'm not a yeah. poker player, but yeah, uh, or the that's eyes dilating, you know, or like shifting and whatever. And some of these guys are just so good, so good. You they're can't. just like they can just bluff and not nothing changes. Heart rate doesn't change. And we all wear Fitbits now. Right. Try to see. <laughs> all right. So what's and the it, flow genome? What do you what the are you flow genome to project? There? This uh, is some other project you have going. Yeah. On. Well, it, it's been around for a while. It's a uh, we do two things, right? Uh, I, our goal is to kind of reverse and engineer the genome of flow. We're using this metaphorically, but like uh, we want to know. Okay, so we're know, not saying like there's some genes in your DNA that are no, the I flow mean, genes. Well, there are, there, there probably are. There are actually. Yeah. <laughs> there are uh, some of the neurochemicals. So Dean Hammer back in the in the '90s discovered he called it the God gene back when we thought one gene one thing. It was idiotic, but it codes for a number of the neurochemicals. That show up in spiritual experiences, but also show up in flow states, right? Um, so-called spiritual experiences. Uh, but uh, so there, there is definitely you know a genetic component. There's a there's a nature and nurture component. No, what we are uh, on, we're a research and training organization. On the uh, research side, we're the largest open source ultimate human performance uh, research project in in the world. Um, trying to kind of it's it's mostly academics and and athletes and artists. 
uh, the, sort of the three groups of people who know the most about flow kind of banded together hmm. to kind of break down ultimate human performance, try to kind of really understand this. And on the training side, we work with everybody from kind of the U.S. Special Forces through Fortune 500 companies. And, you know, as we're talking about flow triggers, right, you can get more of this. And in business, for example, McKinsey did a 10-year study, and they found that top executives in flow are five times more productive in flow than mm-hmm. out of flow. So 500% more productive in flow. We've and how got, do business executives put themselves into a flow state? Same way as everybody everybody else does. You apply, you know, the, there are these triggers. The, the, there's, a, there's a lot of methodology. And j- just to put it in context, just so, so you, we do at the Flow Genome Project, and anybody can take this online, um, this week offer a course called Flow Fundamentals. It's a digitally delivered course. It's six weeks long. It's an hour and a half a week um, with a lot of homework, but some, or not a lot, but some homework. Probably a thousand people have been through this class at this point. We've been, it's been around for a couple of years. And on average, on the other side of six weeks of training with this material, we're seeing a five-fold increase in flow, mm. a five-fold increase in creativity, and a three-fold increase in self-confidence. And interestingly, we've now, uh, the first and second group of trainees have, you know, long enough have passed that we can do a follow-up surveys a year later and things like that. And we're, we're seeing that that those increases are, at, again, increasing. So it's not tapering off mm. and going away over time. It's actually amplifying over time. So what time. do you have, people doing problem-solving things? or It's a ma- – we, we break down the 18 flow triggers. There's a, there's a cycle flow. Is a, it used to think it was a binary, like you're either in the zone or you're out of the zone. We now know it's uh, a four-stage cycle. So uh, that's like sleep cy- or something. The can... cycle is sort of if you know where you are on it, you can read it as a map. You know what to do next. You know what triggers to apply. So there's a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Um, there's a, you know, it's – well, it would take an hour for me to break gotcha. down the break down to answer that question. I'm happy to do it for no, you. No, no, these guys who jump off bridges and stuff like that, though, they instantly get into flow. Those yeah, are the guys a- I worry about. The guys who like in the bird suits and everything. Like they must have the most amazing flow experiences ever. It is pretty quick, and uh, from uh, you know, we work with a lot of top action it's, adventure sport athletes, and um, it's not necessary though, is it? To get to, can they get to a higher level of flow than I can playing poker or shooting baskets or? reading poetry or doing business or writing so because the stakes are so much higher do i have to like threaten death no upon you don't myself? no as i said right financial fear physical fear brain processes are the same way social fear by the way also right you need risk for flow but let's Got just it. look at this one risk is one of the flow triggers right but mm. your brain forget money your brain can't tell the difference between social fear and mm. physical fear Got it. right which is why fear of public speaking is the number one fear in the world and not say getting eaten by a grizzly bear, right? right? You would think evolutionary, it's can, and the reason that is, by the way, is if you go back 300 years and you screwed up socially mm. and you got exiled, banished by your tribe, kicked out, it was a capital crime. Yeah, you would die. Right? You would die. Yeah. So the brain treats it the same way. Fascinating. All right, listen, Stephen, this could go on for hours. You've written so many books. Um, everybody buy The Rise of Superman, Bold, Abundance, but most of all, the latest book, Tomorrowland, is now available on Audible, although you didn't read it. But probably somebody with those silky smooth voices. Silky read it. smooth. Do you listen to it after you and you're like, hey, I wrote that or no? Have you listened uh, to this no, yet? No, I haven't. I know I've listened to none of them. Really? I don't. What if they mispronounce words? I'm sure they do. George I, Clooney read this. I'm, read I'm, this? I'm, I'm, I'm sh- I, I don't actually even know who read it. George Clooney. Oh. <laughs> by the way, Tomorrowland lost like a hundred million dollars. By the way, the one thing that we're pretty sure of is George Clooney didn't read it. Actually, you, you can that's the one that? thing. That was right, the one so thing I think we can be pretty right certain on that. Yeah. By Stephen Kotler was that. Uh, listen, great conversation. An hour went by super fast. And thank you, uh, of course, to Jackie, Emmy Award winning producer. Welcome, Kevin. And oh boy, Jacob, this is it. Last hurrah. What a great job you've done here in uh, just about a year and a half. And I'm going to miss you, but good luck making documentary films and all that other great stuff. It's a pleasure working with you, Jacob. Okay, we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye bye. <laughs>